Welcome to Artist on Art. I am your host, Nada Milkovich. I have the wonderful pleasure of speaking with Maggio, uh, Patricia Maggio of Anna Vami Studio. Maggio, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a wonderful pleasure. I've been interviewing people close to you. I've been getting like circling in to the center. Um, you are an educator, artist here in Santa Cruz. You're uh, one of the the lucky few at the Tannery Arts uh, working as an artist. And uh, we all know how, uh, well, somebody told me only 2% of the artists in America um, make a living as artists. 2%. Wow. That shows our cultural support, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> 98% of the rest of us are struggling. So uh, Maggio has been teaching a class at uh, the Anavami studio. Wh- where is your studio? Over on the west side off Swift Street. Oh, oh, wonderful. In the industrial complex over there. Yeah. And, and then um, you also uh, you teach class in a very different way. Um, usually most painting classes are, here are your uh, paints, here's how to mix colors, uh now let's look at the still life and see if you can paint a vase. Uh, <laughs> right? Right. And it's kind of practicing the in the master kind of way, the way uh, painting began when it first began being academicalized or became a part of academia. It was uh, you copy the masters, you um, get realistic, the ability to realistically render nature. In the Greek way, right? Beauty is that that is closest to nature. Absolutely. Um, and so what you're doing is you are, as opposed to starting with the vision of the object and representing it on the canvas, you you are, uh, this is how I understand it, I've never taken your classes, it was from the people that I've been talking to, It um, you paint through a meditative Consciousness, a different, you, you begin with meditation, you begin a dialogue with the canvas, and it, whatever emerges from, from the painting. That's a beautiful way of saying it. It, it, and it's changing. It's so interesting. Over the last 20 years of doing this, I started in Japan at an art, um, university where I had these students that were incredible technicians. And their concept of Western art was was really different because art has a whole different meaning in, in Japan. And so they were doing what they thought Western art was. And there was very little creativity in it. So I, I ended up creating exercises and approaches that utilized their technique and helped them with the content. And that's where this process started. And it, and it has changed in the last few years. And what you're you're talking about the meditative approach is definitely one of the ways we, a- we approach it. And does that come from this Japanese tradition, or how? how? I, in a way, it does because um, Japanese art, the way I see it anyway, is that it's a practice. It's a spiritual practice, like tea ceremony, archery, every all of the cultural arts of Japan. It's a way of of presencing beingness. Presencing beingness. And is there a ritual involved with getting to this presencing of? Well, I think there is because like when I studied calligraphy, uh, there was, uh, hours of grinding ink and the, the teacher would come up and tell me that, you know, I didn't have the right attitude that if I was grinding ink for him, I need to do it as a child would and not push it down to get it dark fast. You know, as as a Westerner, we thought, you know, efficiency, let's get this done, let's go for it. No, no, no. It's it's just grinding the ink, nothing else. So there's lots of different rituals. As with um, Ikebana, with, with tea ceremony, there's a preparation of yourself before you start. And, and so describe to us how uh, the ritual might be with painting. I, do, you, do you start by making the paint? or? Well, yeah, the, 
Yeah, no, we don't. We don't start by making the paint. In fact, it's um, we we use acrylic. We use lots of paint. We paint on industrial paper. One of the things that's really important, and actually one of the things that I learned in Japan, um, that just blew my mind, was what a materialist I was. I don't. I'm not a conspicuous consumer. I don't buy a lot of things. I don't collect things even. But in spite of that, it is incredibly materialistic. And it surprised me. So one of the things that we really focus on is uh, the unpreciousness of the work that we're doing. That's why we paint on industrial paper. So it becomes a practice. It becomes the activity of what we're doing, not the product, which for Americans, for Westerners, that's so hard. You talk to people about it, they get it, I get it, and then the next thing you know, um, they're looking around comparing or they're saying, this doesn't meet the goal that I want <laughs> because we are product-oriented. You're, you're speaking of experiences from your students yes. in the past yeah. where they, um, well, I mean, that's our expectations are set up that way. You, you're going to take a an art class, then you, by golly, going to get a product out of that, especially if you're paying for it. <laughs> right, and you're going to be able to measure it. Yes, excellent, yeah. not ex, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right, right. Um, but you are approaching painting as a practice, and you're beginning a year-long practice that's beginning now, Maggio. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it's called Painting into Your Emerging Cosmological Cosmological, <laughs> cosmological <laughs> mythology. And I'm going to have to ask you, uh, when you wrote cosmological mythology, what did you mean? Well, and I don't know if you agree with me or not, but um, there's evidence that the civilization that we're living in is falling apart. I, I would agree with that. And Global parent- warming is a big uh, indicator for me. Lots of things, economically, institutions, the old paradigms that we've been living on, living through, um, are not working. The old mythology, and Joseph Campbell talked a lot about how our mythology is so two-dimensional, our heroes, our um, the archetypes that, that come through us. So I've been really, really interested the last 10 years on personal mythology, my mythology, the mythology of my friends, my family, my my people that work, that paint with me. Um, just like in the Middle Ages when uh, we we changed from a flat world, we, cons- we thought we were living in a flat world when we were the center of the universe. And what a huge shift that was. I mean, it didn't change the marketplace much at first, but eventually it changed people's relationship to the ground. They, you know, you couldn't sail off the world. You couldn't fall off the edge. So the same thing I believe is happening now, and the context is cosmology. I mean, new physics talks about laws that are totally different from the laws that we know, gravity. You know, we know from scale that the space that, that exists between atoms I mean, we're getting a whole new picture of our reality, and it's connected to being in the cosmos, not being on a planet or even in a solar system. So this cosmological mythology relates to a bigger picture of us as citizens of the universe. So cosmo- cosmological <clears throat> cosmology is the, the science of how the cosmos work. How it works, how it was created. And then the mythology is taking archetypes uh, from our culture, from our own personal histories. And um, mythology, I'm trying to understand how the myth or the archetype of that's within me and, and that I've developed through life is related to the cosmos. Well, last year I just finished a year-long seminar of painting into our emerging cosmological identity. And that was like the setup for what we're doing. Because like you say, what do the archetypes mean to you in your personal life? And most of the archetypes that run our life, we are not aware of. We often project them onto other people 
which is called the shadow. So as we become more and more familiar with the energies that um, make our decisions, that, that really run us, we can be more conscious of it. So having an identity that relates to the cosmos is as different as believing that the Earth is flat or that believing that there are lots of solar systems, lots of galaxies, probably life out there somewhere. So it's a huge expanse of the context and our responsibility. The thing that's so interesting now, Nada, is that we are at a time where human beings are a natural force in the universe as big as any other force, as big as the tilt of the planet changing, as big as being hit by an asteroid. We could do damage to our own planet in a way that wasn't possible before. So we are a force of nature. And the identity, the mythology, and by mythology I mean the stories of our life and who, you know, connecting, that go along with that are really important. As as you can see. Yeah. <laughs> Maggio, Patricia Maggio, talking to us about her uh, painting classes that she has here um, in Santa Cruz at the Anavami Studios over on Swift Street. She's beginning a year-long painting series called Painting into Your Emerging Cosmological Mythology. <laughs> it's every Thursday from... Actually, it's Friday from it's, 12 to 4. Oh, it's Fridays from 12 to 4. And, uh, and you meet how often? Once a week for three hours, and it usually runs over. So once a week for three hours, uh, you paint, and then you, uh, am I committing to a year-long process? Well, in the last seminar, we had people commit because it was really important to have the knowledge of what came before to fold in. This time, we tried to set it up so people could come in and out. Um, the, the woman who I co-taught with last a year, Pamela Wiley is also has a big piece of what we're doing this year, and it's it's so interesting how it, at least for me, how it turns out. Um, it goes on the on the theory that when we were born, the vibration of all the planets and everything that was happening in that time has a lot to say about our archetypes and our stories. Astrology has a little bit of a different spin on it than the astrology that most of us are used to because it has a cosmological framework. So the people that are painting with me are having their chart done with Pamela and are have um, an archetype that emerges for each month for 11 months. And That's really interesting. It is interesting because everyone's is completely different. You know, if if you have a Neptunian thing happening with with Mars coming in, it's way different than if it's Venus coming in. Right, right. And so it helps to um, look at it in a way, and then you know, in a way that um, gives you information, but it's not mil. It sounds kind of cognitive and mental, but we start out kind of stirring the pot and t- playing with these ideas. And then when we start painting, we just throw it all over our shoulder and go into the colors, you know, the rhythms, and we paint really big, which seems to be important for some reason. And then we sit set back and look at it as if it were a waking dream. And then the information starts coming through, which is fascinating. It's, and hence the dialogue begins. Actually, it begins next week. Um, this week, we got together with the people that have signed up for it and started talking about our archetypes throughout, what they're going to be throughout the whole year. And everybody got in the circle and said, there's no way I can project my archetype through my, you know, chart for the whole year. But as we start talking about it and playing with each other, somebody said, well, I'm not a storyteller. And someone else said, well, you're always talking about stories. Everything in your life is connected to stories. You just said, you know, such and such, you know. And they go, yeah, yeah. They never saw themselves as a storyteller. So having a reflective group that can identify some of these things that we don't identify with, so helpful. And at the end, we we didn't go through the whole year projected, but we went through um, a good part of it. And that's sort of the seed thoughts for people to you know, 
connect to. And also the people that uh, just finished the last year with you. There was a wonderful First Friday Mm -hmm. art exhibit at the Lotus Health, no, Vital body vital body. therapy on uh, there's Water a Street. Yes. There. <laughs> vital, uh, vital therapy. Vital body. Vital body. Uh, there was a, uh, a, a, well, you've had several exhibits there, actually. Yeah, we just finished one, which was the show uh, for this last year. Right. And, and so last year, the painters and, and you and your co-facilitators were uh, exploring the the mythology of the cosmos, mm-hmm. and there's ten powers powers of yes. the cosmos. Yes, and so there you went through that. Could you could you name them off really quick? Or yeah, yeah, no, I could. <laughs> and those powers are the ones that we are using to project the archetypes into with our astrological chart. So the f- first, the zero power is the all that is, the pan original field. So it's everything, and for most of us, it's we think of it as out there in space, but of course it goes completely through us, in the cells of our body, in the atoms, everything. So that's um, zero. And number one... So zero is like pre-Big pre, pre big Bang. It's the pre... Yeah, it's pre-Big Bang. Exactly. Okay. And so number one is centration. So that is um, the pre-Max who, who teach at the university, the astrophysicist, and who has a book called... Um, view from the center of the universe, talks about how we each are the center of the universe in a way. The first um, power is called centration. So that's a concentration. That's who we are becoming. It's individuation. It's us individually. And individual flower, individual fingerprint, individual animal. You know, a little... Life. Yeah, life. And so the second, second one is attraction, which... Attraction, Joseph Campbell talks about, you know, following your bliss. Attraction is what lines up who you are and what you're here for. And you have to trust that. The third one is creation, which is fundamental to life. And they, I'm talking about it linearly, but they fold into each other. They're constellated with each other in all different ways. Fourth is stabilization. So something's created, then it needs to come into being with whatever elements it is. The fifth, which is interesting, is cataclysm. So, you know, the forest can't continue to have trees come up and to have an ecosystem if things aren't destroyed, if things don't disintegrate. And so we often um, panic when we're thrown into cataclysm ourselves, but it's a really important part of the whole process. Six is synergy. And it's something that we think we understand theoretically, but it's not something we live. Living in Japan, where the highest, in old Japan, in the temple Japan, the highest uh, value is harmony. You see people really working together in a way that's something that we're learning here more and more. So seven is transmutation, which is related to cataclysm in that it is um, uses the destructive element to become something else. The chaos. Eight is um, symbolization, and that is DNA, it language, it's um, the codes of life that are repeated so that things don't start all over again. The imploding, the, the big bang, what happened there is happening over and over and over again. So nine is um, absorption, and it gets starts getting a little more esoteric because all of these are folded each into the next one. So absorption is an emitting and a taking in at the same time. And then the last one is radiance, which includes all of them, and it's life and death. It's not life without death. It's con- it's connected, and that is being. It's it's hard to even talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you do a wonderful job, Maggio. Thank you. Um, you are also giving a retreat mm-hmm. that is will that will be happening in September, September twenty second through twenty seventh, and it's in Abiki, New Mexico. Abiquiu. Abiquiu. That's such Excuse a strange me. spelling. Isn't I know. <laughs> Abiquiu, which is about an hour outside of uh, Santa Fe. And it's the area that George O'Keefe lived in. That's right. 
Yeah. And this will be, uh, you'll be staying at the Mesa? We'll be staying at Ghost Ranch. At Ghost Ranch. Yeah, on the Mesa. On the Mesa. Ghost Ranch. I yes. see. And, uh, this will be, uh, five days and nights? Or? Yes. And there will be, um, you'll be painting, uh, again using this large format, um, with acrylics and you will be stimulated by George O'Keefe's Outer landscape, possibly for more stimulation of the inner landscape. Yes. It sounds wonderful. It, it's a, it's an incredible place. I've been going to that area for over 15 years, and I thought I sort of knew to go to ranch. I hiked there, and I have lunch there. And last year, for the first time, I stayed there for five days t- to give a workshop. And it was completely different. It was it, – it just – I carried it for weeks afterwards. It, it must be what people mean by a, um, a power vortex because it stayed with me. And the paintings that came out were really different. It was amazing. It was so fun. And the people that were in the group were people from all over the United States that go to Ghost Ranch regularly. A lot of European people come there. The food isn't great. The accommodations aren't great at all. Some of it's just like bunkhouse. But the place is so amazing and so magical and what it does to yourself by staying there and this painting um, method is tries to really um, capitalize on place wonderful if you are interested you can get more information at anavami.com a n a v a m i.com you can also send a email to anavami at cruzio.com. Mm-hmm. Again, that's A-N-A-V-A-M-I at cruzio.com. You can take a look at more if you want to learn about transformational painting, which is what Maggio has been describing. You can go to transformationalpainting.blogspot.com and you can get all the information. Um, but anavami.com will give you both for Ghost Ranch and for this next series of painting Painting into your emerging cosmological <laughs> mythology. Maggio, thank you so much for coming into KZSC today, and uh, I can't wait to see uh, your next exhibition. Yes, thank you so much, Nada. <laughs>